Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session on performance testing Java applications. So in this session, we'll talk about a methodology and some tools for performance testing. Uh, we're not going to talk about how to tune the JVM uh, and other things like that, even though we'll touch on some of those subjects. So uh, before we get started, I just want to take a quick survey. Uh, how many people are running Java 8 on production? Wow, that's a lot. Uh, anyone still running Java 6? It's okay, you can raise your hand. There's one person in the back, that's great. Uh, Java 7? Okay, it's okay, that's, that's not too bad. Uh, how about 11? How many people are running 11 on production? Okay, that's the other half of the people. Uh, how about 17? Well, that's not bad, that's interesting. There's a lot of people running 17 still. Okay, so my name is Pratik Patel. I'm a Java champion based out of Atlanta in the Southeast United States. Uh, I lead the developer relations team at Azul Systems. Uh, how many people have heard of Azul Systems? Wow, really? Okay. You know we make the best JVM available out there, which I'll talk about very quickly here. Um, so we have an open JDK build called Azul Zulu, which millions of downloads, by actually tens of millions of downloads every month. And then we have a high-performance Java virtual machine called Azul Platform Prime. Uh, so stop by the booth and check them out. Uh, like I said, it's the not only the best, but we think the fastest JVM that you can find out there. Uh, we can talk in the booth, if you like, about uh, different garbage collection strategies and uh, why Azul Platform Prime is so fast and stuff like that. But I don't want to bore everybody with that. I, again, if you want to talk about that afterwards at the booth, um, some quick insights into that specific JVM I was referring to. Uh, just by swapping out the JVM, uh, most of our customers see 20% improvement uh, right out of the box, if not more, right? So for example, with Apache Kafka, uh, how many people run Kafka out of curiosity? Okay, that's interesting. That's only about 10% uh, of the audience. Uh, so if you're running something like Kafka or Cassandra, just by swapping out the VM, you can get 40 to 80% improvement in throughput and, pr and in production. So this is not in from our test lab, but those numbers are actually from our customers. Okay, so stop by the booth. We can talk about that some more. All right, let's move on to the session. So why listen to this session? Why specifically me? Well, I already told you about some of the stuff that we do at Azul in terms of producing different JVM builds. Uh, but previously, in a former life, I led the Java performance team at a very large company. So I've been doing this for a very long time. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting because... One of the, does anybody know what this uh, TV show is? Okay, good. Uh, so this is Silicon Valley. And at the time I was working at a startup and I had to stop watching this TV show because it was too real to, it was too much like real life. I'm not kidding. Anyways, we can talk about that later or at, um, at the bar tonight. Oh, one other quick announcement. Azul Systems is hosting a, um, uh, a party this evening at Kelly's Irish Pub at 7 p.m. So stop by the booth, grab a ticket if you'd like to come join us for a free beer. Oh, who doesn't like free beer? How's that for a question? Okay, good. Oh, you don't like free beer? You just like free coffee? I don't like beer at all. Okay, so they have wine and liquor too, so there you go. So, or coffee if you like that. So anyways, um, the, the reason why I have this slide up here is because when we talk about performance testing, and uh, just performance tuning in general, or the entire performance area. Um, it's one of these things where software engineering is considered to be engineering, but performance testing and performance tuning is more of an art form because there's so many different variables that are in play when you're trying to figure out how to tune your application, or what most people do is when they actually run into an issue, whether in their test lab or on production, how do you fix it, how do you find it? Right, and then what do you do about it? So it's more of an art form than is a uh, engineering exercise, right? So I've, uh, there's a lots of questions in this. So I know it's after lunch, but please try to do your best to try to answer these questions. I know I've already asked a bunch, but first question out of the gate, what's the best way to fix Java performance issues? Anybody? What's that? Prevent them. Prevent them, that's a good one, I like that. Anybody else? I heard some more up here. Increase the memory, right, and, and the other thing that goes along with increase the memory is increase the number of CPUs, okay, that's actually a good one, right, any, any more answers? Yes, that is the correct answer, use Azul, Azul JVMs, uh, that's, come by the booth, we have a special gift for you, so, I did not plant that guy, he just showed up, but he, he knows how this works, so, 
All right, so the answer actually is it depends, right? We all hate this answer, but it depends, right? Again, the question was, what's the best way to fix Java performance issues? And of course, the answer is it depends. And we'll see why that is in this session. We'll talk about some of those things so you get an idea of where to start looking and what you actually do when you have those problems, right? So uh, someone up front said you prevent, those, prevent them from ever happening, and part of preventing them from happening is to find them before those issues go all the way to production, okay? So we'll talk a little bit about that also. So um, it, it is easier said than done, right? How do you find these issues, right? How do you locate them? Uh, how do you know that is the actual issue, et cetera, et cetera? So what I'm gonna do for about the first half of this is I'm gonna talk about the nine steps that, that I use and what our sales engineering team uses at Azul to set up successful performance testing. So this is a little bit boring. There's not a lot of code in this first half. There's not a lot of demos, but we'll get to some demos and some tools, i.e. the cool and fun stuff. But first, I wanna set the foundation for how we actually go about and working with our customers to find and identify performance issues, right? A lot of times, we'll go and talk to somebody who already has a performance issue, but they won't know what is causing that performance issue. So this is what we're trying to get to the bottom of here, okay? So here's the four basic steps. Set up your perf test, run your performance test, dot, 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 profit. Of course, you know, that's, that's a little bit of a joke, but what we're going to be talking about is that dot, dot, dot part in this session. All right, so three steps before testing. Now, I know as a software developer myself that uh, I hate putting together a plan. Hate is a strong word. I don't like putting together a plan. It's much more fun to do what? To just jump into some code or start making, you know, start playing around with the amount of heap that you have allocated into your JVM. Or maybe you'll go and increase the memory or try a couple of different things and maybe that, basically what I'm saying, all these things that I'm saying is we're throwing stuff against the wall to see if it sticks. But unfortunately, this is not the best way to go about doing this, right? It, it, just like everything else in software engineering, you have to have a little bit of a plan to be able to figure out how to get from point A to point B. So we'll talk about these for a few minutes. So the first thing is defining your goals, right? If you already have a performance issue, then this is not a hard goal to figure out, right? It's basically, we have a performance issue and we need to fix it. But a lot of times what you want to do is you want to be a little bit proactive about deploying a new application or a new feature or a new release into production. So when we say defining your goals, we'll get into each one of these in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. But for example, what that means is you can say, okay, in the last release we expected 10,000 concurrent requests a second, but we're going to probably get more users because we're releasing this new fancy feature. So maybe we need to go from 10 to 15,000 request a second or something like that. So those are those, that's one of the goals. There's other goals like what's the minimum amount of latency we want our users to have, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so the second thing before you start actually testing is think about your environment. Again, we'll get into all, all of these bullet points in more detail. The third thing, of course, is know and understand your application, i.e. think about your app, what it does, what kind of architecture you have, are you using Kafka, you know, maybe you're just using a database, I don't know, right? So we'll get into all those in a few minutes. Right, three steps during testing. Operating system settings. Surprisingly, this is one of the big ones that a lot of people run into trouble with. Again, we'll dive into each one of these in a bit. And then of course, while you're actually doing your testing, you need to have the proper tools to be able to run these tests and to gather information and data that you can do analysis with. And then as part of that process, you collect performance data so that you can do that analysis. All right, and then three steps after testing analyzing performance test results, finding the actual bottlenecks, and then fixing those things, or at least trying to fix those things, and then repeating your testing, right? Just like everything else in software development, performance testing is an iterative type of exercise or iterative type of task, okay? You don't just throw something into the thing and magically everything is good, right? So start with the first one, define your goals. And we're gonna spend a little bit of time around this. Because one of the things I'd like to do in this initial part of this session is to introduce you to the nomenclature. Well, let me say it in, in a slightly easier way. Introduce you to some of the terminology and the different words that we use to describe how to think about performance and what are some of the, what's some of the, the 
basically the terminology that we use around this, okay? So when we think of performance testing goals, we look at it from a number of different viewpoints. What is the SLA that you might have with your user or your customer, okay? What kind of stability requirements do you have also, right? So this is, you, all of you have probably heard this, right? You have like, you know, three nines or four nines, right? 99.99 uptime and stuff like that. Right? We're actually not going to talk about that that much. We're going to talk about it from a different point of view because we want to zero in on the performance testing characteristics of your application. Right? And the other thing around this is what kind of throughput does your application need to have? And what latency can your users or your customers endure without them complaining or having problems with your application? And as you can guess, all four of these different axes that we're looking at for our performance test are all interrelated in some way. Okay. So an example of that is if you increase your throughput, what typically happens in your application? This is a question. It's not a trick question. We have trick questions later. But if you increase your throughput, what happens in, what can happen in your application? Your latency goes up, right? So a lot of these things are interrelated. That's exactly right. So it's, in some ways, it's a balance, right? How much latency will your users be able to endure with how hard you can push your existing system? Okay, so let's introduce some terminology. One of the things that we talk about in terms of latency is in percentiles, or the 99th percentile in this case. Now, what this means, we'll look at this in a diagram. So how many, how many are familiar with the a phrase P99? Okay, that's actually really good. That, that, that's almost over half the audience. But let's do a review for the other half of the audience that's not familiar with what P99 and P95 means. Okay? And maybe you'll learn something along the way if you already know what that means. All right. So when we talk about P99, that means 99% of the requests should be faster than the given latency. Okay? The other way to think about that is that only 1% of the requests are expected to be slower than that P99 latency. Okay? So let's think about this very simply for a second. Uh, and, and this is a little bit of a contrived example. Uh, is if you count up the numbers on the left, you'll see they add up to exactly 100. So the math is easier uh, for everyone to follow along. So if we look at this specific table, we have these requests, and this is the latency for each of those requests, right? So five requests have 1% latency. Um, and Well, five requests have one, one second latency. And then 20 requests have five second latency. And then one request in this test run had an eight second latency. Okay? So, if, again, it adds up to exactly 100, which makes it easy for us to understand exactly what P95 and P99 means. So, if we look at this, we can say that our P95 or our 95th percentile is six seconds because 5% of requests take longer than six seconds to complete. And our P99 in this case is seven seconds because 1% of requests take longer than seven seconds to complete. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Okay, good. So again, I'm trying to introduce some of this nomenclature and how we think about when we're measuring performance, what we're actually looking for, and how we compare it to different performance runs and things like that. All right, so again, a little bit more about latency. So in this example, we say a minimum we have a minimum latency of 0.01 seconds. Our median latency is 0.2 seconds. And then we have outliers, which are a maximum of 7.2 seconds. Right? So if we think about this, right, and, and again, there's a larger data set behind this. But when we look at this data, we would say that our P95, again, looking at our data set, is 0.5 seconds. And our P99 is 1.3 seconds with an outlier of 7.2. But the way that you, I like to think about this is at the bottom here. We say for 95% of users, the latency was below 0 0.5 seconds or 500 milliseconds. Now, when we're talking about SLAs and performance and things like that, this is the question you have to ask yourself at this point in time, which is, is it okay for 5% of our users to have a latency of greater than 500 milliseconds? Okay, because as a software engineer, like many people in this room, I want the lowest possible latency all the time for all my users. But the problem with saying something like that and setting up a goal like that is you set yourself up for failure because sometimes it is impossible to get to a place where every, each and every request is below 100 milliseconds. Actually, I take that back. 
It's not impossible. What you're doing is you're wasting resources when you try to set yourself up with a SLA, which is very, very low, and you don't really need it. Because what happens if you try to achieve a really, really good SLA, very low latency response times? You have to build out your infrastructure to be bigger and bigger to be able to handle that load that you have. So i.e. you're using a lot more resources than you really need to, possibly. Okay? So it's just something to think about. All right. So again, I already said these words, but the, the way that we explain this to a customer or to um, business people or whatever is we say, we want 99% of users to have less than two, sec two seconds of latency. And if your business people sign off on it, then you have your goalposts. Then you know exactly what you're trying to achieve. Right? Another way to think about this is we need to push 100,000 messages a second through Kafka with some latency metric attached to that. Okay? So again, trying to help you understand how we define goals when we talk to our customers and how we go and think about these things so that we understand how to do performance testing, find problems, and also do uh, preemptive um, preemptive optimization within our systems. All right, so another way to think about it is that P95 is less than, oops, why did that happen? Okay, P95 is less than 500 milliseconds or P99 is less than five seconds, right? So these are other things, other ways that we talk about this to understand exactly what we're trying to achieve. All right, so let's move on and look at this in a graph form. So we're gonna see this in a graph in a few minutes, right? But when we basically look at a latency graph, we'll get some kind of curve that looks like this. And what we can do is we can look at this curve and we can say, okay, at approximately 120 milliseconds right here, this is our P95 and our P99 is at 200 milliseconds on this curve. So we're gonna see this in action uh, in a few minutes. All right, let's move on and talk about the other eight topics. The next one is thinking about your environment. All right, so I don't have answers for these specific questions. This is a much more detailed conversation, but are you running in the cloud? Are you on-prem? Are you on a single server running a monolith? Or are you running a distributed monolith? Are you running on Kubernetes? These are all things that come into action or come into play when you're trying to think about performance and how to solve it, performance problems that you might have. And the other thing around environments is where are you testing your performance stuff or where are you doing performance testing? So here's a question. Where's the best place to do performance testing? Anybody? Okay, you guys have seen my talk, obviously. The best place to, to do a performance testing is on production. And I want to get a t-shirt printed up that says, I don't normally test, but when I do test, I test on production. Right. That includes unit test. I'm kidding, of course. So, All right. So uh, production performance analysis is the best because it's almost impossible to replicate a production environment in a test lab. And I know this from experience. When I was working at a large telco in the US, um, our management was very afraid of testing on production. So I said, okay, that's fine. I said, this is how much it will cost to set up a production, an exact mirror of production. And they're like, wow, that cost as much as our production environment. I was like, yes, that's exactly how it works. <laughs> right? Go figure. So we were running about two and a half million dollars worth of hardware at storage, et cetera, et cetera, on production. And I went calculate everything up and I said, this is how much it's going to cost. And guess what they did? They gave me two and a half million dollars to do that because they were so afraid of running performance tests on production. They were like, here you go, just don't mess with production, please. I was like, okay. So we built up a massive lab that replicated the petabytes of data. You know, I probably had, um, I think we were running about 12 or 1300 cores in production, multiple, multiple terabytes, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways, you get the idea. Okay, so, but not everybody has that luxury of being able to just have an exact mirror of production. And one of the things that I'll talk about a bit later when I demo some tools is that you can actually run performance analysis tools on production which are non-intrusive. This is what we all want. We want tools that we can run on production which don't interfere with any other parts of the system or don't affect your application running. That's what we mean by non-intrusive. Okay? This can be very difficult. So, for example, um, how many folks in this room run something like AppDynamics or Dynatrace, just out of curiosity? Well, not curiosity. So, Ko, I'm going to pick on you since you're running, sitting in the front. How much overhead do you think AppDynamics or Dynatrace add to your production system? Just take a guess. 
You have to use the agent. Yep. Five percent, ten percent, fifteen percent. Twenty. Wow. Okay. All right. So so Coe's sitting in the front here. I picked on him because I know him. Um, so I asked if you run uh, Dynatrace or one of these APM tools in production, how much overhead does it have? It adds a lot of overhead, right? So this is what we especially want to avoid when we run test or we do analysis in production because we don't want to add any overhead. We don't want to disturb the system that we have because then your test is actually affecting the performance and it, it creates a very difficult situation for you as an engineer to understand what is actually happening, okay? Now, we talked about trying to replicate a mirrored test environment um, from production, and of course, you, you, you can do that. It can get very expensive. However, nowadays, it doesn't have to be super expensive because what you can do is you can just write a Terraform script, for example, and say, for this application, just spin up a whole bunch of servers that are based on the exact same Terraform script that we use to build up production. You bring it up, you run your perf test for an hour or two, and then you bring everything down, right? Because of the elasticity of the cloud, we have the capability of actually mirroring production, except for one thing. What would that one thing be that would be difficult to replicate from your production environment to a test environment? Okay, that's not quite what I was going for, but that's very close, or that's about right. Data, exactly. Right, so if you're running terabytes, or well, not terabytes, if you're running petabytes and petabytes of data, how do you copy those databases or that data over and make sure you know it's the same data and stuff like that? It can be very, very taxing to do that. Um, and, and if you use anything like S3 or, or whatever, any kind of database in, in the cloud, uh, you know that it's not cheap. So anyways, let's move on. All right, so let's talk about performance analysis on production. I like to use simple tools to do this. And, you might be surprised at this, but you can get almost 90 to 95% of the way there just by using the three things that I have listed here. Using GC logs, thread dumps, and a tool that I'm going to show you in just a second called jhiccup. Right? And the other trick of, uh, with this is that you don't have to apply these tools for collecting this performance data across every node in your cluster. Let's say you're running 10 nodes of your Spring Boot application or your Kafka servers or whatever. You can just apply it to one of them and see how that one works. So you, essentially what you're doing is you're doing a little bit of a risk analysis and risk reduction exercise at this point. Right? So if one of the nodes goes down in, those, in that 10 node cluster, it's not the end of the world necessarily. Okay, you, yeah, you're taking a little bit of a risk instead of a gigantic risk by running this, these tools on every node in your, uh, in your cluster. So there are ways to actually do this and convince the people that you work with in your management that, hey, let's just try it on this one node. If it goes down, yeah, it'll be a little bit of a problem, but we're not bringing the whole app down. Okay, so again, some things to think about when you're trying to do this. All right, so I mentioned the cloud already. We talked about Terraform scripts. Uh, let's talk about cloud deployments a little bit more. Right, so we talked about Terraform, helpful for repeatable test. Um, and someone up, up front actually mentioned traffic patterns. So that kind of goes into networking and storage and other things like that. So when you're doing horizontal scaling in production, are you accounting for all those different things that you might have to be uh, on the lookout for when it comes to you know, not just your Java application? Are there things in the constellation of your application that might cause problems that you need to look out for. So I'll give you a quick example. How many people run Kafka again? Put your hands up. Okay. So what's the fastest way to speed up your Kafka brokers and your, um, your Kafka brokers? This is a little bit of a trick question. Okay, it's actually not, that, that, that is, that's a very good answer. The answer was disable acknowledgements. I don't know if you necessarily want to do that because there's a trade-off, of course. But the answer is way simpler than that. Right, anybody? What's that? Add more. Add more. <laughs> well, then we could then we get into this discussion. If you have a Kafka uh, broker with multiple partitions and you add another uh, partition on a different server, then you have to go and essentially fan out all your data across the new set of partitions, which becomes a problem because it's not as easy as it sounds, right? The actual answer is you always make sure that when you're running Kafka in production that you use SSD storage because Kafka is heavily I.O. bound, right? So it doesn't matter if you give it more memory or CPU, that's not really going to help. What will matter is if you give it faster SSD storage rather than spinning disks or something like that. So, Anyways, these are things that we have to think about as performance engineers. Are we looking at the big picture and all the way down into the bottom? 
All right, so another thing is that cloud environments tend to be more resource constrained. So we have to be aware of this. It's not the same as running on-prem with your own servers. And it feels like to me, hopefully nobody from AWS or GCP or Azure is in here, but it feels like to me that every year those CPU slices that you get on cloud environments get smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, it may just be me, okay? Anyways, you get the idea. When you're running in the cloud, you're running on somebody else's infrastructure, they manage the CPU slicing and other things that you get. So there's potentially less CPU cycles, the storage is slower, et cetera, et cetera, right? I'm not saying that's bad, it's just something that you have to be aware of as a performance engineer. All right, so let's move on to item number three. Thinking about your application, right? Are you running Spring Boot? Are you running Java EE? Are you doing event streaming with Kafka, right? Are, are there external locking resources like a database? So I'm not gonna dive into this because this is an entirely different presentation that's many, many hours long when we think about this. So we want to stay focused on the performance testing part. Um, but out of curiosity, how many people are still uh, building and deploying Java EE apps? Okay, that's not as many as I thought. Every, Spring Boot? Okay, it's pretty much everybody, okay. All right, so another thing is that, and this may be, hopefully this is not being recorded, but um, I know Reactive has been a big buzzword over the last few years, but Reactive is not necessarily a silver bullet when you're thinking about production, uh, sorry, thinking about performance. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it, but it's not necessarily the silver, bu silver bullet that you might be thinking of, okay? Another thing that you have to think about, about is are you running in Kubernetes environments and you're doing auto-scaling? That means that there's a good likelihood that your Java processes are short-running rather than long-running. Right? Again, some things that you have to think about. Because, for example, it, when we think about Java and short and long running processes, what is the big difference in terms of performance for a short running Java app and a long running Java app? Uh, that's a good one. That's not exactly what I was aiming for. Yeah, go ahead. The, 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 the garbage, the, yes. Actually, you're talking about the JIT compiler. compiler. Right. So, so he hit it exactly on the head. How long does it take for your application's JIT compiler to reach maximum efficiency? Right? What's that? M minutes, maybe. Usually tens of minutes, depending on how large your app is. Okay? And how aggressive your JIT compiler is. Anyways, you get the idea here. So if you have short running tasks or you're running in Cube where there's a lot of auto scaling going on, then not necessarily going to be great in terms of, you know, does it even matter if my JIT is good or not? Because it's not up long enough to get super efficient. Okay, two more things. Uh, one of the things I like to talk about quite a bit is nobody has load that looks like this. Everybody has load on production that's like this, right? So what you have to accommodate for is the peaks and how much headroom do you need when a peak comes in or when you're at peak traffic. All right, so let's breeze through some more of this and get to the demos. Uh, let's talk about OS settings. Uh, so th these are some basic things uh, that most of you probably run into. Uh, when you're running a Java app, you should always set the U limit to unlimited. Um, the VM is basically uh, what are you setting for your swap size, and then LSOF is uh, a way to look at the number of different file handles you have open and stuff like that. But I think if there's nothing else you take away from this, if you're running a Java app on production, you should never, never, ever have swap enabled on it. Because if you do, you're gonna run into problems. Hopefully that's obvious to everybody, why you should never have swap enabled for a operating system that's running your Java application. Uh, and the way that you turn off swap is you use that command that's on the second line. You turn off swappy, set swappiness to zero, and that gives the operating system a hint as to never do swapping, okay? So you should never swap. This is a super easy one. Um, we've actually seen people who had had swap on, and they're like, why is it? Why is this running so slow after a few minutes or a few hours? And then you look and they're running a massive swap and they don't have enough memory allocated into that virtual machine. So anyways, all right, so let's get on to the fun stuff and talk about tools for perform performance testing. So the Visual VM is something I'm gonna show here very quickly also. Uh, I, is there anybody who hasn't used Visual VM in here before? Okay, so a few people. So I'll do a quick demo of that um, so we can see what that, uh, what kind of data that produces and how that can be helpful in looking at things. And we're also gonna specifically look at the Visual VM uh, garbage collection plugin to see what our GC cycles look like. Uh, and this is for uh, a live running application. 
Okay, there's also Java Flight Recorder, which is good for finding issues with uh, deadlocks and threads, well, just thread contention in general. Uh, and what you do with uh, JFR, or Java Flight Recorder, is you do some profiling uh, that does put some load on the system, as you can imagine, but you typically, something like this, you can just turn JFR on, hook it up to your VM, take a profile snapshot for 10 seconds, 60 seconds, two minutes, five minutes, whatever, and then you can turn it off so that you don't have that overhead for profiling your information, okay? And then you can do analysis of it directly within JFR. We're not going to demo this. We don't have time to do this. Uh, it, just doing a demo of JFR is an hour-long presentation unto itself, okay? And then how do we uh, put load on our system if we're not testing on production? Uh, we're gonna use JMeter in this presentation to actually put some test uh, load onto a Spring Boot application and see what that does, right? There's other tools like Gatling. And then there's a bunch of great command line tools like JSTAC and JSTAT, which give you garbage collection and thread information, uh, which can be useful. And the great thing about both of these tools is that you can just log into a server on production or in your test lab. You can run the command. It'll print out some data. And again, it's non-intrusive. Yes, of course, there's a little bit of overhead when it needs to go get your GC stats or it does a big thread dump. But it's not something that's constantly there and affecting the performance or the operation of your system. All right. <coughs> so the other tool I want to talk about, which most of you have probably not heard of, is called JHiccup. How many folks have heard of this uh, tool before? OK, so I see some diehard Azul fans in the back. That's great. Um, so what jhiccup does is it measures pauses that affect a running JVM. And that pause can be from anything in the JVM or all the way down into the operating system. And this is a surprisingly simple tool. It was invented by our CTO, Gil Tenney, who's a Java champion. And what we do is after we put this in, it just outputs stuff into the log. We'll see it in a few minutes. And then we use a, a log analyzer, a histogram log analyzer, to see what the output is and see where our pauses were within our application. And that allows us to correlate things that are happening either on the operating system or within our Java application to pauses within the JVM. Now, the most common cause of a pause within a JVM is garbage collection, right? So hopefully when I run this demo, we'll be able to see when a GC pause happens in the GC log, we'll be able to directly correlate it with a spike in our jhiccup output logs. Okay, and what jhiccup does very simply is it, it, the timing isn't exactly right. It's actually much, much less than one second. It's like on the order, I think it's actually one millisecond. Basically, it's just a background thread that spins in the back and it wakes up every uh, millisecond and it just records the time when it woke up. So you can see every millisecond if there's output from this jhiccup. And if there's something that caused that thread to not execute, then there is some kind of latency in the system. We'll see that in a second so it's more obvious, but let's look at this in a diagram real quick. Okay, so again, for one millisecond, we stop, we record what that time index was, or J Hiccup records that time index. It wakes up, records the time index, and then you can see towards the right side, if something was going on in the JVM that kept that thread from waking up and putting in a timestamp, then you know that something was going on. That's simply how it works, right? Super easy. All right, so if we look at this from a different perspective, if there's a GC that happens, for example, and you're using a stop the world garbage collector, um, it will say, again, diagram explains everything. You can see that there is one millisecond, two milliseconds, four, five milliseconds, boom, now the thread wakes back up and this is when Jay Hiccup gave us um, uh, the, the uh, timestamp output. All right, and the way that we use jhiccup is it is a Java agent. Um, this is the exact command I'm going to run in a few minutes to go have a look at this. Okay, so you basically say, here's jhiccup. This is where the log file, well, it'll just output the log file in the directory from the running Java process. All right, so the other thing that I'm going to use here is there are a bunch of different uh, GC log analyzers available. Uh, Azul has one uh, called the uh, Azul GC log analyzer. Right, not a very descriptive name or a colorful name, but uh, it's used for looking at the logs produced by Azul Prime, that's our high performance JVM, as well as Azul uh, Zulu, which is our OpenJDK build. 
the version of this GC log analyzer for just standard open JDK is not available yet, but it will be in the, in the future. Okay. But don't worry, uh, there's loads and loads of other tools for doing garbage collection uh, log analysis. Uh, I know a lot of people like to use GC Easy, for example, gceasy.io, I think. Uh, what are some of the other GC analyzer tools that uh, you guys use to look at a garbage collection log? Anybody? I mean, this is not what you do on your spare time on a Saturday, take uh, GC logs and, just kidding. There, anyways, there's a bunch of them freely available out there, but we're going to use this one. Okay, we're almost to the demo, and this is what the demo setup looks like. We're going to run JMeter to drive a Spring Boot application, and I've enabled GC and JHiccup logging, and then along the way we'll look at Visual VM and uh, Visual GC. Okay, so, oh, actually, one thing I should note here is we're going to do a combination of two things. And the first thing we no may not necessarily do on production. The first thing is we're going to actually have a live view of this application running. We're going to look at the GC and like the load and stuff like that from a live perspective. But when we actually do our analysis, we're going to look at the actual log. So we're not actually doing a live analysis of everything. We basically set up a test or for setting up in production, we go and let it run with these non-intrusive tools collecting data in the background and then we go look at them afterwards to see what's happening. Okay, so a combination of both is useful, but of course when you're looking at something on production, you don't want to go and do something that changes the performance profile of your running application. Okay, so it's time for a live demo. That's, uh, there is one other tool that I don't have running, which is Visual VM. I get the right one up. That's weird. Oh, there it is. All right, actually, let's go ahead and start a few things up, and we'll get Visual VM running in a minute. Okay, so I have uh, the Spring Pet Clinic application. Most of you are probably familiar with this. This is just an app that you can go download, or a w application that you can go download from the actual Spring project. It's just a I wouldn't call it a reference application, it's just a demo application for Spring Boot, okay? And I think almost everyone in this room writes Spring Boot, so you're familiar with uh, Spring and probably familiar with Spring Boot. Uh, it actually also comes with a JMeter test file. So I purposely chose this because you can, pull, you can clone this repo, you can build uh, the Pet Clinic app, you can get JMeter, and you can run everything that I'm going to demo out of the box without doing anything, right? Basically clone the repo, go get these other tools, you can fire it up and you can run this on your own um, whenever you like, okay? So this is the test plan. Uh, it's quite long, I won't go into it too much. I have it running in JMeter right now, not that one, this one right here. So if, uh, that should be big enough, but if I zoom in a little bit, you will see that uh, it does a couple of different things. Goes and finds an owner and edits an owner, does a new visit, does a post on a new visit, et cetera. It's just exercising the application, okay? So we're gonna go run this in a minute. Let's go check our directory here. Make sure I've cleared out all the log files from the last run. And then let's go and start up history. Okay, let's go start this up. Now, again, Right here, this is how I tell it to go and output the GC logs. So X log colon GC star, what the star means is output all the GC data instead of a subset of it. And then I have the J hiccup agent running here, which I mentioned previously. Uh, that will go output into a separate log file. So let's go start this. And um, I'm actually running Java 18 for this. It doesn't matter what version of Java you use for both these tools, okay? But this is Java 18. So now our app is up and running. And let's go to our JMeter app here. Let's clear this out. And I have this specific thing set up in this test plan to run, um, well, not 100 threads, but 20 concurrent threads with a ramp up time of 20 seconds and 100 loops over this entire test plan or load test load plan. So let's go run this. And we'll go and go to our... Everything should be running now. I'm trying to remember where the, um, oh, looks like we got an error. Here's a log viewer. That's what I was looking for. Okay, so down here, nothing super interesting here, but you can see that this is JMeter starting up. These are the threads, and it's now looping through all the different threads. 
to, um, to go and run this specific test plan. It looks like we run into some kind of error. Uh, for the time being, I'm just going to ignore this error. This is probably something within Spring Boot itself. Uh, wow, a lot of these errors. Okay, that's okay. Let's see what happens, though. Oh, I didn't mean to shut it down. Great. Sorry. Now I have to go and clear out all the files. All right, so this is actually, let's open this file. Let's see what's in here. Okay, so you can see that uh, from the GC settings that I put in here, uh, it's giving me all the data for the logs, uh, the garbage collection specifically that's happening. Okay, so I don't want to go into too much detail on this because this is a lot to cover uh, in a short amount of time. So let me just remove that log. Okay, and then let's go have a look at the J Hiccup log real quick. Okay. So as I mentioned before, uh, what it does is it basically prints like a little timestamp for the last uh, for when it started up. Uh, so uh, since we just started this app up, there's not a lot to see. We didn't really put it under much load, so let's clear that out. Okay, let's let me just go remove. Did I already remove that log? I did. Oh no, I didn't. Okay, so let's remove it, and let's go start our. Pet Clinic app again. Okay, and uh -oh, what's going on here? Something didn't like. Okay, that's fine. It's probably from a previous test run. We'll find out what's going. Oh, I know what it is. Uh, I still have the J meter running in the background. So it's it, as soon as the app started up, it started hanging it again. But that's fine. So we'll let this run for a minute, and we'll we looked at the log files already. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these two tools. Uh, the first one is this histogram log analyzer to look at the uh, output of the J hiccup log, right? So these are uh, two previous runs that I did. Uh, we're going to add a third one in in just a second. And then we're going to look at the GC uh, log analyzer to see what the garbage collection log looked like. So uh, let's see if this is still running. It is still running. So we'll let this run for a little bit of time. I'll let it build up some data. Uh, but while it's running, uh, I have a question to ask. If you're running a performance test, how long should you run a performance test? Whether it's in your test lab or on production or whatever. But let's say it's in your test lab, okay? Uh, <laughs> hey, only I'm allowed to use the answer, it depends. That's actually a good answer, but l let me reframe the question. Um, what is the minimum amount of time that you should run a load test for performance gathering reasons in your perf lab or in your test lab? Let's take a guess. Okay, there, there, there are lots of great responses there. Someone said 10 minutes. 10 minutes is not long enough, but usually 30 minutes is long enough. However, we recommend to our customers that you run a perf test for at least 60 minutes because that gives you a fuller picture of what's actually happening. You can see more garbage collection. You can see the JIT, like especially if you just started the application. Uh, for example, the advanced uh, JIT that's in uh, Zool Prime takes 20 to 30 minutes to get fully warmed up on a large Spring Boot application, okay? So just for the JIT to get warmed up, warmed up, warmed up, and to get to maximum efficiency and to do all the things it does, like method inlining, et cetera, et cetera, to optimize the code and to get the best performance, usually takes 20 to 30 minutes just to hit all the code pads and optimize everything properly. So you want to look at it like when the system is fully optimized to get a real-world view of what their performance actually looks like, okay? All right, so we let this run for a bit. It looks like this is still running. So let's go into here, and the first thing we'll do is let's open up the log, which will open up right here, if you remember from when we tried this, and this is going to be impossible to see now because it scrolled off the edge of the screen, uh, and it looks like we're still getting errors. That's fun. Okay. All right, so where did that log come from? If you remember, I started this Spring Boot application with this right here, and I said send the output to test uh, Zulu 18. So I'm using Azul JDK Zulu version 18 specifically for this, and uh, I can verify that by saying Java dash version, and you can see there's Open JDK uh, 17, and I'm using specifically the Azul Zulu build of it, uh, and not Prime. I didn't want to use the a JDK that you can't normally use. Uh, for doing tests like this, so I'm just using uh, Zulu for this, okay? All right, so let's open this log file up, and we got a null pointer exception, great. 
It's a good thing I have something else open in the background. Okay, I think that was the previous one, but let's look at the GC positive. Okay, so let's have a look and see what these GC positives look like. Again, we're, all this does is it looks at the GC positives um, or the GC information, not necessarily the positives. I have it on the positives right now, but it looks at our garbage collection um, information and you can see in the number of seconds that have elapsed since we started this, these were the number of GC cycles that have happened so far, okay? And it tells you uh, how long it took milliseconds and at what specific time index, but this is the diagram that we care about, uh, which is when did the pause happen and how long was that garbage collection pause? So if we look at this one right here, you can see that this garbage collection happened at 22.7 seconds after we started the VM, and it took 23 milliseconds to do that garbage collection pause, okay? If we look at this one, this one happened at 57 seconds after we started the VM, and it took 38 seconds to do a GC pause, okay? So when we're working with folks to identify potential performance issues, garbage collection pauses is obviously something that comes into effect. Right? If we see a lot of, actually this diagram doesn't look bad because the pause is only 38 milliseconds first of all. And second of all, yes, there are lots of like smaller GC pauses, but you expect that in a Java application that's creating and destroying um, objects. Okay, so this is not necessarily bad. When it's bad, what a bad garbage collection uh, log looks like is when you have everything is a spike or the duration is very, very, very long, right? Everyone knows this as a Java developer. What you want to do is avoid long garbage collection pauses, okay? And of course, uh, the way to avoid garbage collection pauses is to use a pauseless garbage collector, which Azul Prime has in it called C4. And there is, um, there's one, in, now I'm not going to remember because I'm up on stage in front of 200 people. Um, what's the open source pauseless garbage collector that's available? Shenandoah, thank you. I total mind blank there. Yes. So there is a pauseless garbage collection, uh, collector that's available in OpenJDK. It's called Shenandoah. But we also have one which is a little bit more advanced called C4, and that's in Azul Prime. Okay. Anyways, let's go and look at our J Hiccup log, and let's see if we can correlate the two here. Okay. Let's open this in a new tab. Okay. So let's do this real quick. So we said that in our garbage collection log here, we saw that at 57 seconds, there was a big spike, right? Slightly longer garbage collection. And if you remember what J Hiccup does, is it just, it's just a thread that measures latency all the way in from the Java process down into the metal of the operating system, right? Or the computer. So that means that anything that causes any kind of latency in your JVM not just in the JVM process will show up in this diagram. So that means if something is going on in the operating system, for example, if you have swap enabled and then you run out of, uh, and you know, again, don't ever have swap enabled, number one, but if you do, um, and the operating system swaps your memory into disk, that's gonna cause latency and that will show up on this graph, for example. Or if there's some kind of network issue, that will also show up on this graph, okay? Again, J Hiccup just measures the ability of a thread to wake up every millisecond and say, hey, I'm here and this is the time. So anything from the Java process all the way down to the actual CPU or storage or whatever will show up on this graph. So we saw this pause at 57 seconds and let's go look at this right here. And if we look here, you'll see that we actually hit J Hiccup registered a little bit of a spike in its ability to kick off every second, right? It measured a little bit of latency. And if you look, this latency was registered at, I'm sorry, that just went away, right? Can you see that? Yeah. So you can see this latency was measured at 60 seconds in, um, and it was approximately 37 seconds, or milliseconds, sorry, right? 60 seconds in, and it was at 37 milliseconds, okay? And if we go here, you can see there's a direct correlation between when the garbage collection pause happened and when J Hiccup saw a pause in the operating system, okay? So again, both these tools, the garbage collection pause and J Hiccup, 
can be used for doing non-intrusive performance analysis on production or wherever you're running it. Again, the key words there are non-intrusive. You don't want to mess with your system that's running there. Okay? But you can see that because we have this GC log and we have the J-Hiccup log, we can correlate that garbage collection to a specific pause in the operating system in our J-Hiccup. So if we go to here, this may be a little bit out. So let's see if there's one at 300 milliseconds here. All right, uh, actually this doesn't go that far. Um, this specific log doesn't go that far, but let's see if there's another one. 180. All right, so that's 117. 180. All right, so this is 100, it'd be somewhere around here. We could, there it is, right? So again, J Hiccup registered a little bit of a late, a little bit of latency in the VM at 120 seconds, and that correlates to this one right here, which this timer said it was 117. So you can see it's at about exactly the same time. Basically, the peaks in the GC on one side show up in the J Hiccup on the other. Okay, all right. So we're almost out of time here. So uh, we've already covered all the, the rest of these slides for the most part. So we talked about this. Okay, we talked about the latency. Uh, we did have a look at Visual VM. Um, this is fun to look at, and it can be really useful for identifying certain class of problems. Uh, this is specifically the Visual VM garbage collector um, real-time view. But to be honest with you, this spins so fast that it's not really very useful on production especially. Okay, we looked at the pauses, and we're not going to do a prime demo. All right, so we've talked about most of these things. Real load is better than simulated load. Uh, focus on business metrics, ignore everything else. Right? We've talked about all these things. Garbage collection pauses are a problem. We talked about different garbage collector algorithms, um, JFR. We talked about JIT warm up time. Garbage collect what I mean by garbage collection warm up time is that when an app first starts up, and so for example, for Spring Boot, it creates a whole bunch of objects initially based on annotations and stuff like that, right? So that's going to create more, more garbage to be collected. That's what GC warm-up time means there, right? Everyone understands what JIT warm-up time is. And we looked at correlating J hiccup latency with garbage collection. Uh, we didn't get a chance to do JSTAC um, for taking thread dump analysis. Um, and we don't typically take heap dumps, but I think uh, everyone probably runs with the second thing, which is heap dump on out-of-memory error. So if you're seeing a problem with memory and you get heap dump errors and your VM exits, you put this in and then you have this gigantic heap dump that you can spend the next three days trying to figure out what actually happened. So, all right. So uh, a couple of last things in, in closing. Um, one of the main problems that we see when we talk to people is that as an engineer, you're like, hey, let's, let's try this fix and let's try this fix and let's try this fix. Maybe it's one of these three things. And you're tempted as a developer to do what? Just throw them all in at the same time, right? That's the wrong approach to take. What you should do is just try one fix at a time, run the test, see if that made a difference, then try the next one. So basically try all three in isolation. And we can get into a discussion about, well, what if this fix and this fix are the things that fix it? Now you have multiple permutations of things. But usually, when you look at the results from the two tools that I talked about, and you look at other things in your system, you check that the database, make sure you're using, for example, a non-blocking JDBC driver, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can pretty quickly arrive at the combination or one or two fixes you need to fix something. Okay. So, um, right. So I think we have to get out of here. Uh, we have a few minutes in here for follow-up questions, uh, but we'll also take I'll also take some questions at the Azul booth, so you can grab a T-shirt and. Not this hat. There's another hat that we have at this show. So anyways, uh, I apologize for running over a little bit, but I thank you for coming and hope you enjoyed that.